Are you ready to try your hand at placing your very first stock trade? Then check out our free guide, 10 Steps to Choosing Your First Stock to Trade, The Ultimate Beginner's Guide. In this free download, you'll learn how to choose the right kinds of stocks and how to find them, know when to buy your stocks and when to sell them, and you'll learn how to take your very first steps to becoming a stock trader and much more. Grab your free guide now by going to tradeway.com slash guide. That's tradeway.com slash guide. Hey guys, I'm David Mitchell, founder and CEO of Tradeway. What if God himself gave you a blueprint for how to handle your money? Well, the Bible is a practical book. Let's dive in and see what it has to say about wealth, about risk, about leverage, and about investing, and uncover how trading in the stock market can be a powerful tool for moving towards your biggest goals. We're so happy you're here. This is The Word on Investing. Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. Today I want to talk to you about seven principles that the wealthy use. Now, I want to put this into the context of the Christian wealthy, because I'm pretty convinced that people that don't know the Lord sometimes are able to make their money a little bit different way than the way a Christian would go about it. In fact, I'm certain there's a difference. So I just want to keep it in the context of how Christian men and women create wealth. I've got a couple of ways we'll look at this because I think that everywhere in the scripture that God promises wealth to his people, they are conditional promises. What I mean by that is it's like an if-then proposition. It's like God says, if you do this, 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 and this, then I will bring wealth to your family. It's not like just a general promise or an unconditional promise that every Christian is going to be wealthy, obviously, or that every person is going to be wealthy. It's always conditional. So when we look at these passages of Scripture today, we're going to look at two things, the promises and the conditions. All right, so let's read this first one, Psalm 128, verse 1. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands, Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house, thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. Now let's go back and look at the promises found here. And to, to do this, you know, the Scripture says two places in the New Testament that the Old Testament is written for our admonition, those of us who are living at the end of the age. So all of the Old Testament might be used by us today to bring more depth, more colors of meaning to the different doctrines that we learn in the New Testament. And all of it can be applied to our lives. You just have to kind of think through the old Hebrew mind, like how did they think back in those days when God used these penmen to write this? Now, we know God is the author of it, but the penmen were humans. So we have to always ask, who are they speaking to? What are they, what's the context? What are they speaking about? Does this apply to me directly or indirectly or secondarily or not at all? We have to ask those questions to keep the 10 proper rules of Bible interpretation. So we'll, we'll be doing that throughout this. So let's take a look at this now. Here are the promises. The first one, blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord. Well, just the phrase blessed, we need to stop and think about that. Put it in the context of the old Hebrew mind in the Old Testament. Go back and look at the time of Abraham, for example. And you've heard me say this before, that like uh, the sheep and the cattle and the camels, that's their money, right? That's their wealth creation. And when they talked about blessedness, they did not just look at spiritual blessings. They also believed that the Lord blessed his people in time and space on the earth in this life. And so when they said, I'm more blessed than my neighbor, they didn't just mean I have more spiritual blessings and gifts, spiritual gifts than they do. They did mean that, but they also meant I've got more camels than they do. I've got more cattle than they do. So blessedness always included the physical and the spiritual blessings that the Lord gives us both now and in the next life. And we have to understand that when we read this. So when we see that it says, blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that is the first promise is blessedness. You're going to have more camels than your neighbor. (laughs) Think of it that way, because that's what the Hebrew meant by it when this was written. Now, here's another one. 
for thou shalt eat the labor of thine own hands. Guess what that's talking about? Asset protection is what we would call it today because it, you know, in those days, you could have enemies just come right through and burn down your hedges, which kept your animals and livestock in to your part of the land, burn down your hedges and come right through and steal your flock, right? And so you could lose your assets easily. But when you had God's blessings, then you got to eat the labor of your own hands. They didn't come in and burn your vineyard. And that's what it means. So you see how we can take their life, how they think, how they lived, and what they mean by what they say, and we can apply that to ourselves today. That's asset protection. For thou shalt eat the labor of your hands. Not another man will eat it. You will eat it. See? See how that works? All right. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Well, that gives a couple of other promises. You'll be happy, and it'll go well with you. You'll have good health and happiness. And then it goes on and says, your wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of your house and your children like olive plants round about the table. Well, that means you'll have a good, solid, sound marriage, which is the bedrock of a great home, right? I mean, it also keeps churches together. It also keeps nations together. So that promises a good marriage. And when you talk about the children like olive plants round about, they're learning your skill sets You're going to invest in their ideas, and that's going to create generational wealth. So there we have six promises. Being blessed, and that means financially in the mind of a Hebrew. Secondly, asset protection. Thirdly, happiness. Fourth, health. And then a good marriage, and then generational wealth are all found in this passage. Now, as I said, these passages will also always carry the conditions. What is it we have to do? Well, we see it right here at the first verse. Blessed is everyone that what? Feareth the Lord. So the first condition is we must fear the Lord. And the second one is found right there in the same first verse. It says, and that walks in his ways. So the two conditions to have blessedness and asset protection and happiness and health and a good marriage and generational wealth in your family are fearing the Lord and walking in his ways. What does it mean to fear the Lord? Well, you know, all you have to do is think back when you were a kid and you can figure that out. You, uh, you're at the house, you disobey mom, and mom gets upset with you and says, you know what, when dad gets home, I'm going to have him have a talk with you. And you, you worry about that quite a bit, and then you start playing, and you kind of forget about it, and then 5 o'clock, you come back in those days when we kept <laughs> normal business hours. Uh, and, then, and also when dad used to work at an office, right? So dad then comes in the door, And all of a sudden you remember what mom said and you look up at him and he looks at you and you have a healthy fear of your dad. That's the kind of fear this is talking about. You're not afraid of your dad. You just fear when you've disobeyed a healthy understanding that God is always watching us. God is always monitoring what we do, what we think and how we live and especially how we treat others. Because with Jesus Christ, everything was about people. And boy, he doesn't like you picking on his other sheep, right? So, so yeah, so that's what fear of the Lord means. What does it mean to walk in his ways? That means you got to know his ways. So you're walking in the word, you're reading the word, you're meditating on the word of God, you're studying the word of God, you're not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. In other words, you're going to church and hearing it preached, doing the things that the New Testament tells us we're supposed to do the way God set out his system that's meant for our well-being, and you're doing those things. You're walking in his ways. All right? So that's the first concept is the Christian who becomes wealthy is a person who fears the Lord and walks in his ways. He's in his word. He knows his ways, and he tries to walk in his ways. Now, when I say try, we're not perfect, are we? So you might want to review 1 John 1, 9, and when you go read that verse, ask yourself, do I believe that verse is true? Read every word of it, think about every word, and then think, do I believe this verse is true? Because if it is true, it means you can get up and start over again with a clean heart as you walk with the Lord. That's kind of a rabbit trail. So let's go to the next point. The wealthy Christian, the next thing he knows is that he must work hard at gaining skill sets. Now, gaining skill sets is hard work, but it's also fun work because you're learning to do something new something that could benefit your family financially, perhaps, such as going out to Tradeway.com, taking advantage of all the educational programs out there. And they include so much cool stuff like stock baskets with, say, a hundred of the best growth stocks in the world, 
picked by yours truly. So we call that the founders list. You gain access to that. You gain access to market alerts where we teach you the market tone so that you can get your play and flow with what the whole market's doing. All these great things are out there. And the main thing is this would fulfill one of God's main conditions of wealth creation, and that is gaining skill set. So let's take a look at that in Scripture, because if you're like me, you believe that the Bible is inspired by God. In other words, it's God-breathed, and every word is important, and that not only did God breathe his word and give it to us, he promised to protect it and keep it to the last generation so it's preserved and we still have it, and it's God talking when we read it. So look at what God says here, Proverbs 3.13. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain, therefore, greater than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies. Now, when we look at this, it's a personification of wisdom, right? Wisdom, knowledge, and, and understanding. So that is more precious than rubies. And all the things that you can desire are not to be compared to wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Length of days is in her right hand and her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are the ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Now, that was 17 verses there in Proverbs chapter 3, starting with about verse 13, but there are seven promises found in that passage. Now, look at what God says. Now, yeah, we will talk about the conditions here in a moment, but let's look at the promises first. The first one is happiness again. Now, we mentioned that a while ago, but happy is the man that finds wisdom and understanding and so forth. Now, let's put this in modern terms. What is wisdom and knowledge and understanding? It has to do with skill sets. It has to do with learning the proper skills for any particular type of business that you might do, for example. And you can easily see how God would stress this as more important than rubies and gold and all the money you make is the knowledge because the world can take the money away, but it can't take away what's between your ears. That is the knowledge that you had that made the money. So God says this is hugely important. So in Proverbs 3.13, the first thing we see is happy is the man. So here again, we see happiness. Now, I want you to see what's next, though. Happy is the man that finds wisdom, the man that gets understanding, in other words, skill sets. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof is better than fine gold. Now look at that word gain, because the word gain pictures asset appreciation. So your assets are growing in value. Now it doesn't, that's great for your balance sheet, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't stop there. It says she is more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. So we see that not only do we look at gold and silver and things like that that can just picture assets that we have that are great for the balance sheet, but when we look at that word gain, again, it can mean profit. So now we're looking at the income statement. We're looking at cash flow, which also this brings to our family. And it doesn't stop there. It says length of days is in her right hand and in her left hand riches and honor. Now think about length of days. Is that talking about living a long life? Well, how does that relate to wealth? Well, in any age, any era of human history, the wealthy have had better access to the medical science that existed in their day. That's true today as it's always been. And you can look at statistics. People in the poorest of countries have a shorter lifespan than people in the richest of countries, and that's because wealth brings access to better medical care. It's always been that way. It's still true today. So length of days is in her right hand. In her left hand, riches and honor. What is that talking about? Well, when you talk about the word honor here, it means influence. Now, as a Christian, one of the greatest things Jesus left for us to do is to go into all nations and preach the gospel. But we're not supposed to just preach it. We're supposed to tell the good news to people and have enough influence where they actually want to listen to us or think they ought to listen to us. Otherwise, it just falls on deaf ears. And one of the greatest things that the Bible teaches that can bring influence for anyone who's going to go out and give the gospel message is wealth. Because like it or not, the lost world compares wealth to success. I mean, at the same time, out of one mouth, Hollywood and all the movies and everything will badmouth the rich, wealthy business owner you know, the industrialist, the capitalist, 
On the other hand, they all want to be like that person, have all the stuff that they have, right? So the world is kind of confused on it. But the thing that they're not confused about is that the person that's accumulated a lot of wealth, like Warren Buffett, for example, when he talks, people listen. And the same is true of any Christian who can accumulate wealth God's way, is people will listen because that person will have influence according to the Scripture. So in her left hand is honor. And then it goes on and says her ways are the ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. So you have a pleasant life and a peaceful life. Now, if you want to read some things into the idea of peacefulness, you might see asset protection again there and protection from spiritual warfare where the world, the flesh, and the devil tries to take away everything you've gained and to tempt you to do stupid things in your life that could cause you to lose it and so forth. You also have protection against all of that. So we see seven more promises here. Happiness, asset, appreciation, income and cash flow growth, long life, riches and honor, or you might call it influence, a pleasant life and a peaceful life with asset protection and protection against spiritual warfare. We all need that as Christian entrepreneurs. Now in Proverbs chapter 8, verses 10 and following, it continues this idea It says, receive my instruction, and it adds one new word. So now we've talked about knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Now it adds the word instruction. Receive my instruction and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that might be desired are not to be compared to it. Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue better than choice silver. Now, this adds a few things to the seven promises we saw in that last passage. First of all, the thing that caught my eye here and caused me to include this, because it sounds similar, but one thing it adds, of course, that idea of instruction is added. But now it not only talks about riches and honor are with me. Here it says, yes, durable riches. Now, think about that. That, you know, that kind of carries the concept of asset protection, doesn't it? But what it means is, that from generation to generation in your family, as you teach your children the Word of God and how to walk right, and you teach them the skill sets and all the businesses that you own, you're going to create generational wealth. That's called durable riches. They don't just vanish with the next generation. They don't just blow the money. You've taught them how to make the money. So they make a game out of it almost. It's like, how can I make more money than dad? I mean, how can I make more money than grandpa? And all of a sudden it just continues this idea of wealth creation down through the generations. And that's the promise of durable riches. Now, don't you find it interesting, though, that it includes the word righteousness? It says, yea, durable riches and righteousness. How can wealth creation cause a person, or let's just keep it in context, a Christian, to be more righteous? Well, we, we know here we're not talking about positional righteousness because we don't cause that. God does. It's a gift. <laughs> it's one of the 33 things God gives us at the moment he regenerates us, and he gives us the faith of Christ. He gives us his Holy Spirit to indwell within us, and he gives us the righteousness of Jesus. That's called the doctrine of imputation. He put our sins on Christ and counted it to him as if he had done them, and he died in our place and paid the sin debt. But then he took the very righteousness of Jesus and gave that to us as if we had done it when we didn't, but we do own it because he gave it to us. So when the Father sees us, he sees us as perfectly righteous. In fact, that's what the word justification means in the Bible, the whole doctrine. That's what it means. God the Father sees us as if we've never sinned. Well, this passage in context is not talking about that kind of righteousness. It's talking about what we call experiential righteousness. That means trying to live right. You know, having a better walk, trying to be a better man or a woman, that's a part of it because, and now listen, that doesn't cause the salvation, but those are effects of it, you see. So this tells us that if I have created wealth, it gives me more time freedom. What can I do with that time freedom? Well, you know what? One of the things I can do is read and study and meditate on the Word of God more than if I was working, you know, 10 hours a day for the boss man, right? So now I am the boss and I own my own time and I have other people perhaps working for me. I have duplicated myself in them and delegated my tasks to them and taught them how to do it. And now I have some time freedom. I can actually be in the word more. I would be a better Sunday school teacher. 
As a matter of fact, I'm a, what they might call, the world might call it a lay pastor. I've been a pastor for 40 years now, and I've never taken a salary from the church because I own three businesses, and I don't have to because God blesses the business. But that business also frees up time once I learn how to delegate and duplicate, which is part of skill sets of business. Now I've got smart people literally running these companies. They only call me when there's a problem, and usually they handle most problems. So I have even more time to study God's Word and to teach it and preach it. So, I mean, if I can do that as a pastor, you can do that as a Sunday school teacher. You can do it just as all you're doing is teaching your children. And I shouldn't say all you're doing because that's probably the most important of all the jobs. It frees up more time. So riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. That's experiential righteousness. And in verse 19, my fruit is better than gold, better than fine gold, and my revenue. Now, the word revenue is income statement, cash flow. It's better than choice silver. Now, the one thing I want to go back to here is um, this word instruction. Receive my instruction. Because now we have a new condition. We've already mentioned some conditions, such as fearing the Lord, walking in His ways. This passage brings about four more conditions. And one is, it says, find wisdom. Number two, find understanding. And then number three, find knowledge. Those are ones we've already seen, right? But here's the new one, instruction, get instruction. Well, guess who wants to help you with that? Tradeway. If you want to learn the skill sets for how to trade stocks as a business and then how to teach those skill sets to your children and grandchildren and have potential to create generational wealth, go out to tradeway.com and start gaining the instruction. Now, you know what that's all about? We call it time compression. It took me 40 years to learn how to do this, and I learned some from my grandfather, so it goes back even a couple more generations. That is a lot of time that our family took to learn this, but in four two-day events, I can teach you a whole lot about what it took 40 years for me to learn. So we can compress all that time, all those years, into several hours. Isn't that cool? That's called time compression, but it's also what the Bible calls instruction and why God says to get it, because he knows you're going to do better if you can compress that time and you know learn what it took people 40 years to learn in a few weeks. Now, I'm not going to say you can master stock trading in four two-day events, but you can learn the skill sets. Then you have to practice. We advocate that you do, first of all, paper trading and then what we call small money trading, right? Most of you guys have heard about that where you take a small amount, say $500, $1,200, $2,000, whatever small to you, and you try to double or triple it in three or four months. If you can do that, keeping the rules and including your losses, then you might want to talk to one of our coaches and see if you're ready to trade with more money, maybe $20,000 or $50,000, but don't try that until you can be successful with 2000. Doesn't that make sense? And so you're gaining the skill sets and then it takes time to master them and get good at it to make sure you're keeping the rules and all that. But that is what God's talking about when he says, get the skill sets. So there we go. So we're still talking about skill sets, but let's look at one more passage. Proverbs 24, three through five. Through wisdom is a house built, and by understanding it is established. Now, remember, wisdom and understanding, those are the Bible terms for skill sets. Then it adds the third one, which is knowledge. Verse 4 says, And by knowledge shall thy chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Wow, I think I see a promise there. And then the last verse, verse 5 says, A wise man is strong, yet a man of knowledge increases strength. Wow. Now, that's only a few little verses, about three verses, but it is packed. So let's look at the promises. First of all, through wisdom is a house built. This is not just talking about a house. It's talking about a home, really. It's talking about like generational wealth creation, homes pictured as castles that the whole family lives in. You know, that's that's what it's talking about, generational wealth creation. A home, a house uh, is built. How? Through wisdom and by understanding it is established. That means it doesn't just crumble in the next generation. It keeps going. That is a fantastic promise. It's nothing like the new money that you might see out there in the lost world, say in Hollywood or in the music industry or in the, or in the sports industry where they make money for the first time, but they don't have these skill sets because no one else in the family's made the money and they didn't take the time to learn the skill sets, and before you know it, one more generation, and it's blown, right? 
and they, the family starts over. That is not the Bible way. The Bible way is to pass those skill sets down to the children and then to the grandchildren and also provide financing through the family business for their new ideas. I mean, this is just God's way of doing it. So, so look at this promise. First of all, strong family and generational wealth is promised. Through wisdom is a house built, and by understanding it is established. Now, the next thing it says is through knowledge, and we're talking about skill sets again, the chambers, in other words, you know, in those days, they didn't put the money in a bank. They stuck it in a, you know, a fortified part of their castle. So their chambers are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Why? Because they walk with the Lord, they fear the Lord, and they did what God said. They went out and got skill sets for whatever business their family's doing, and they taught it to their kids and grandkids, passed it down through the idea of the family business. What we want you to do at Tradeway is just that. We don't just teach stock market at Tradeway. We teach the idea of the family business all over this country. And we want people to get back to that. Instead of sending a kid off to college to learn something to do that no one in the family's ever done, teach them the skill sets that you have done and that you've mastered and that has started creating wealth in your family so it will continue to the next and the next generation. That is God's way. So here we see the promise of a strong family of generational wealth and that your chambers will be filled with precious and pleasant riches. That is a promise of riches. Now, like I said, it's always going to have conditions, isn't it? Uh, but anyway, there it is. There's the promise of riches. And then look at this last part. A wise man is strong, yea, a man of knowledge increases strength. What is that promising? Strength and increasing strength. So the wealth becomes like a moat around your castle and your family's the castle but it gets stronger and stronger with each generation. So it is protection against the world, the flesh, the devil, and so forth for your whole family. So what is the condition in there? The only condition that I find in any of these passages that we just looked at is get skill sets, get the proper skill sets in the business that you're doing and have wisdom and knowledge and understanding because you're in the word and you're studying God's word as well. And when you do that, you have these promises now, I think that's beautiful, and I want to cover maybe one or two more, and we'll be out of time today. But let's look at one more. So first of all, what have we talked about so far? What are the principles of wealth creation? The first is for a Christian is fear the Lord and walk in his ways. The second one is work hard at gaining skill sets. We just finished that one. What's the third one? The third one I want to talk to you about is found right here in Proverbs twenty two twenty nine. It says, Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men or average men is what that means. All right, so the third one is diligence, the never quit attitude, the being decisive attitude, being diligent attitude. This is the condition. So see a man that fulfills the condition that God says we have to do for wealth creation is being diligent in his business. Then uh, he will stand before kings. Now, what's interesting is the Bible in quite a few places in the book of Proverbs especially says that every wealthy family that has ever existed started out in poverty. My family did. My great-grandfather had a sixth-grade education and no money. He was a junk dealer. And he came to Mahia, Texas and got involved in the oil field there during an oil boom, figured out skill sets for his whole life. And by the time he was 65, he ended up being able to purchase the Mahia oil field. They fracked the wells. They came in like new. He became what in today's money would be close to a billionaire, I'm sure, overnight. And he began to buy leases in East Texas and West Texas. So he took our family from poverty to wealth. And then he taught those skill sets to his daughter, which was my grandmother and my mom and dad and so forth, and passed them down through the family. They taught them to me. I've taught them to my kids not only in that business, but a couple of other businesses we own now. So uh, the, key, the key is to be diligent. My great-grandfather spent his whole life in that oil field learning how it worked. And he set aside a little money every pay period. And he had enough money by the end of his life to have 20% of what it took to buy that oil field. And he borrowed the rest at the bank and he bought it. And then he paid the bank back within about a year because the oil came in better after he fracked them. That's just how God took care of him. But that's how it starts. Every family starts in poverty, 
And then God says, and the way he words it so often is he says, and then this man will be blessed by God and stand before kings, which means now you have influence because you made money and the king wants to hear your ideas. So you went from poverty to that place. You stand before presidents. You know, you, they want to know what you're thinking because you're successful and you have influence because you've created wealth. Now, so the condition here is diligence, though. What does it mean? Well, in the Hebrew, it is the word mahir, which means literally quick and skillful. It also means diligent, but it carries the connotation of hastiness and being ready. So think about all that. Now, it kind of carries the connotation of decisiveness and also this having the skill sets all ready and being ready so that when the opportunity arises, boom, you can be decisive and take advantage of it. You don't have to go out and learn skill sets to, to figure it out because by then the opportunity's too old. <laughs> you got to catch it when it's right, the right timing. And so you got to be flexible. You got to be decisive. You never quit. All those are connotated by the meaning of this Hebrew word. So it comes from a smaller Hebrew word or a root word, mahar, which means to be liquid and to flow easily. And it can imply being in a hurry. But I think that kind of implies being flexible also because we, listen, we don't always succeed, do we? Don't we fail sometimes? So when we fail, that's just God closing a door and opening another one to show us his perfect plan because our plan was not his plan. Now he's going to show us his plan and it's always better. But you got to be flexible and you got to never quit and you got to give God time to close the door he doesn't want you going through and open the one that he does. And that takes some time, but he will move you through it if you keep this condition of diligence. Isn't that cool? Well, let's look at one more place that talks about it. Proverbs 10, 4. He becometh poor that deals with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Now there's a promise and there's a condition. The promise is you get rich. The condition is you got to be diligent. Now what's interesting, this is a different word in the Hebrew. It doesn't come from the same root word that means be flexible, be in a hurry. In other words, be decisive and don't quit and all that. So let's read it, and I'll show you this new word. It says, But the hand of the diligent maketh rich. The blessing of the Lord it maketh rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. That's verse 22. So that's Proverbs 10.4 and Proverbs 10.22. Now, the word for diligent here is call roots, and it means incisive. It comes from a root word which means threshing, a threshing instrument with sharp edges. It carries a connotation of determination and eagerness to get the job done. And so incisive is not a word we use so much today in English, but if you look it up and say the Oxford Dictionary, it means a person who is intelligently analytical and clear thinking, and of course, that has the skill sets behind that. So that's the condition here is that type of diligence. What are the promises? Riches. And I love in verse 22 where it says it brings no sorrow with it. You know what? New money without skills, without knowledge, without walking with the Lord and the wisdom of the Lord and the love of God in your heart, it will destroy a family. That kind of money will destroy a family and kill the children. They will die. But when you get it from God, and that's why I love this part here in verse 22 where it says, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. So it goes from like skill sets to, hey, there's another component. God has to bless the work of your hands along with the skill sets. But when the riches come that way, he adds no sorrow with the money. Isn't that beautiful? So the money will be a blessing to your kids and grandkids. It will not destroy them. But what is the condition there in that promise? The condition is be incisive and decisive. Isn't that cool? Incisive means to use wisdom and be analytical and thinking. In other words, have the proper business skill sets and think through it properly like you would for that particular business. And decisive means you take advantage of the opportunities and you're right ready when they come up so that you can take advantage of them right then. Okay, guys. Wow. You know, I've got seven points. We just covered three of them today and that's all the time we have. But I think if you go back and listen to this and contemplate it, it is rich. Just what we looked at today. Next time, Lord willing, we'll pick up the other four points. So I hope this has been a blessing to you guys. And if it has, I hope you'll rate and review it so that people that think like we do can find it and maybe be a blessing to them as well. And I hope you have a great day. We'll see you next time. 